Okay, and welcome back to our Introduction to Media Studies class. Again, my name is Dr. Rodriguez, and today we're talking about models of communication. First of all, I want to thank you for the great discussion that we had previously. When you considered ideas like how would you model communication, what is required for communication in your opinion? And so today we're going to define three models of communication that emerged historically and sequentially to define communication in the latter half of the 20th century and early 21st. So, while we're discussing these three models of communication, what does each highlight? What does each neglect and ignore? And which explains the process of communication best in your encounters? And I would like to also point out that these models of communication operate in uh, at different levels of communication. We could easily apply these to interpersonal communication uh, as well as to mass communication. Mainly we'll be discussing these in the context of mass communication and its development over the past hundred years. So let's continue. And first we'll talk about the linear model, which emerges in the post-war years. In 1949, it's developed by this man, Claude Shannon, Shannon and Weaver, model of communication from 1949. And this is a, a rigorous model of communication. It's mathematical in nature. It comes out of engineering. And uh, it's really at a moment in time when radio and mass media meant that researchers wanted to develop a universal model of communication. But one of the ways in which, uh, so first of all, reflecting some of the terminology that you used in the discussion, that there has to be a speaker, there has to be a listener, there has to be a message. We find that in this model, there's a sender or a transmitter, a message, and then also a receiver. That would be equivalent to the listener. And this concept of noise where there may be some sort of interference, as if, for instance, you were uh, having a conversation in public and there was ambient noise from a construction site or people's pets or conversations or whatever. Uh, but one of the ways in which this model has been critiqued, one of the, one of the drawbacks is that it's, it's described as being perhaps too rigid. So um, another concept from our discussion that came up would be a way to make this a more dynamic model. So that's when the interactive model of communication develops. And, um, you know, the introduction of feedback results in an interactive model. So one early example of this might come from the study of radio at Columbia University, uh, a collaboration between Columbia University and CBS Radio, which was spearheaded by the researcher in mass communication. He's very famous. His name is Paul Lazarsfeld. Uh, this uh, Columbia Radio Research Laboratory, and uh, early test audiences would come in and they would uh, weigh in in real time on radio programs using electronic clippings. So this this was actually a controversial collaboration at the time. No one had ever tried a, uh, a collaboration with corporations within the academy before, but this was in a very successful and early example of of radio research, relying on the concept of feedback from audiences. So here's here's our interactive model, where we have feedback that is moving from your uh, the listener back to the speaker, from the, the receiver to the transmitter, essentially. And so this concept of feedback, gradually over the development of mass communication, is something that is applied to different media. And as different media are adopted, so from the days of radio, which is adopted in the 30s and 40s as a mass medium, then the introduction of television occurs in the 50s and it becomes popularized and adopted in that decade. And so we have the development of television research out of that. So another example that, that comes out of mass uh, media research in this vein is the work of Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall was the director of the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at Birmingham University in the United Kingdom. Um, and he wanted to focus on, uh, they, they 
at the CCCS made the uh, somewhat radical move at the time to say, hey, let's study television audiences in the Academy. Before that, the Academy was essentially the realm for study of high arts, things like cinema or painting or literature. And here comes Stuart Hall and the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, and they say, well, let's study television audiences and their nuanced readings, quote unquote, of the of the television texts or television programs as texts. So so this is in in some respects a class based argument as well, because we're saying let's take this popular medium and study it as if it were a high art form and, and get some of the very nuanced readings of the audiences from that. So but he introduces this idea that encoding is not necessarily decoding, that the people who produce television and other media uh, are going to encode it with a certain meaning and then the audiences will decode it uh, differently. And this, this is introduced in the 1970s. So, so looking at the readings of audiences and their, and their nuanced and complex readings within their own communities. I have my own example of this, which is more contemporary and it's not from TV, but it comes from the realm of Hollywood blockbuster movies. Who here has seen the film The Matrix from 1999? This is a great film, and uh, maybe if you have, this is a, you know, think of it as a uh, quintessential 90s movie. It kind of encapsulates the spirit of the 90s, living in a time when the internet is just becoming popular, and, and it's the newness of electronic communication um, through the internet. In this movie, Keanu Reeves, uh, Keanu Reeves plays our, our hero, the hacker Neo and Morpheus, his teacher, played by Lawrence Fishburne, pictured here behind the glasses, gives Neo the choice of taking the red pill or the blue pill. The red pill will open his eyes to the truth of the virtual reality around him. The blue pill will just put him back to sleep. So what starts off as a great metaphor in a science fiction film that's about the cool internet over the past 20 years actually develops in an unusual way, uh, an unexpected way, because now we have conservative voices online that have subsequently reinterpreted this scene and it's become a meme, the blue pill, red pill. And uh, many within uh, conservative online communities, particularly on Reddit, interpret this scene to refer to opening people's eyes to the conservative truths obscured by what they, within their communities, refer to as a liberal conspiracy of politically correct culture. And so uh, this is a, a meme that is often sent around within circles on Reddit that are constituted by uh, incels or involuntary celibates, people, usually males, who promote ideas that are infused with toxic masculinity and misogyny. Uh, it's also been evoked in conversations regarding Brexit in the UK. And uh, so according to the, the Guardian UK, to red pill became, became a verb opening the eyes of new recruits to their hated oppressors, feminists, people of color, and progressives. Morpheus became the face of memes that asked, what if I told you that Hitler was a socialist? So what was originally a cool sci-fi metaphor for virtual reality and the newness of the internet has become a conservative meme and encoding does not equal decoding. Stuart Hall's encoding and decoding is an example of the interactive paradigm of communication and our interactive model of communication. But there's, there's a third model that's become prevalent in the 21st century. And that's the transactional model. And you can see in this model, which is more cyclical, that the line between sender and receiver has been blurred. Communication is something that takes place over time and in a context, uh, in an environment, for instance, at this university, in the year 2020, um, in the Asia Pacific region. So our updated version of communication is a more sophisticated model of communication. It's more nuanced. And there are two unique examples that come from the area of 
communication and media studies that I would like to mention. The first is convergence culture, and the second is social media. And these are examples of our third model, the transaction model. So, my first example, convergence culture. Perhaps many of you studying media have heard this term, convergence. Well, it comes from Henry Jenkins' seminal 2006 book on convergence culture. And he directed the, the MIT Media Lab for two decades. He said that media is converging in terms of form and function. So in terms of form, that means that the phone has unified the function of the telephone, the TV, GPS, a camera, a PC, etc. We can see that all of these various media forms that were previously distinct have been compressed down to the one device. In terms of function, we can use the example of streaming services and how they blur the line of what is considered TV. If you have content that's being produced by Netflix and Amazon and people are watching it on their phones or their laptop computers, can we still call it TV? So according to Jenkins, media is converted converging in terms of form and function. And he, he was very forward thinking um, and ahead of the curve when he introduced this idea because it was uh, before the popular adoption of smartphones, which had become ubiquitous in the ensuing years in the late 2010s, uh, excuse me, in the late 2000s and, and throughout the 2010s. So convergence culture is an example of the transactional model of communication because Jenkins in his book uses the example of the matrix to talk about how the producers, the Hollywood producers, um, created a, an entire universe for the audiences for the movie. And so, first of all, the matrix is not merely a Hollywood blockbuster film, it's also a video game. It's also a, a set of graphic novels. It's also a, uh, a, a prequel that is in the format of Japanese animation that is quite good and uh, called the Animatrix. And so, so it is a cross-platform media, uh, an example of cross-platform media. And in as much as this is true, it means that the, the producers of the content have created an interactive and, and highly uh, engaging world for the audiences to, uh, to create content with or to play around in and to understand the connections between the, the characters across these various platforms. So it's a, so it's a highly engaging environment. In, in as much as this is true, it means that the, the Matrix franchise is actually an example of the transactional model of communication of these games between Hollywood producers and their audiences. Um, but also, I would introduce my own example here that, all, that comes from Hollywood blockbusters in the form of Easter eggs. Easter eggs is, are also an example of the transactional model of communication. And now, according to the dictionary, an Easter egg has taken on a secondary uh, definition now of a hidden feature in a commercially released product. Okay, so these might be uh, little details that are included by the producers of blockbuster films such as the Avengers or Star Wars that, um, that tease the audiences and, and induce them to a higher level of engagement with the media. And so there's, there's a history of these in Hollywood. We go back 40 years, for instance, to Raiders of the Lost Ark, which was directed by Steven Spielberg. This is the first Indiana Jones film. It's a collaboration with George Lucas, who directed Star Wars. And we see... Um, you may notice on the pillar here, there's a, in the hieroglyphics, R2-D2 and C-3PO, the androids from Star Wars, but they're appearing in the Indiana Jones movie. And so this is just, uh, and also they're here on the wall behind Indiana Jones. So this is just one of the ways that uh, Hollywood producers began to play with audiences dating back even 40 years. If I were to choose some more contemporary examples, and I'm sure you can think of yours as well, there's the movie Endgame, uh, the last Avengers film, which had a cameo by the, event, the man who created the Avengers in graphic novel and comic book form, Stan Lee, pictured here as a hippie burnout about to ride off into the sunset. And this was his last on-screen appearance. So fans would have been thrilled to see this. Um, also Star Wars and uh, 
I grew up in the 80s, but I was not actually a Star Wars fan until this recent trilogy of films came out. I love it. And I've learned a lot more about the uh, mythology. Perhaps some of you are Star Wars fans too. But uh, did you know that uh, if we look at, so remember Darth Vader, the bad guy, the iconic bad guy from the original trilogy, his armor was actually inspired by uh, Japanese samurais. And in the new franchise, his grandson, Kylo Ren, is totally obsessed with Darth Vader. But um, at one point, he destroys his mask in a, have, because he has a tantrum, and then he repairs it in the new film. And this is actually uh, the repaired mask, which has these, um, these imperfections in it, is a reference to the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with gold, which is referred to as Kinsukoro. So uh, the idea, the spirit of it is to conserve the artifact and also highlight its imperfections. So this not only reflects the, uh, the personality of the character, but it's also a reference to the, the original Darth Vader character. So you'd have to be a fanboy, and I kind of am now, to research and discover this on the internet. Just another example of how Hollywood producers are engaged in a transactional form of communication with their audiences now who are going to go out and take all of these details and, and um, analyze them on social media, analyze them on YouTube or on Reddit, on Facebook, Instagram, etc. And, uh, and so, of course, it's not just Hollywood that is in this new transactional mode of communication. There's also so-called interactive media. Not just television and movies, um, but it's a game as a game between producers and audiences, but it also applies to social media and public relations. And for many of you out there who may be interested in pursuing public relations, advertising, or media marketing, um, this is relevant to you. You no longer have a linear so-called model of communication where there is a clear uh, speaker and a clear listener. And so the whole concept of interactive media fits squarely within this interactive model. Why? Because social media produces a higher level of accountability of companies and producers to media consumers. So we can see an example of this from PR Watch and their, uh, their analysis of people per hour, which launched a series of ads saying, you do the girl boss thing, we'll do the SEO thing in 2019. And MSX then, saw this and was aghast, took to Twitter and called out people per hour. Their response was lackluster, so she gathered her forces in the public relations industry and went to the Huffington Post, the left-leaning publication here in the United States, and, uh, and got them to write an article about this. People per hour subsequently took the ad down and, or replaced it with an ad that said, you do the boss thing, we'll do the SEO thing. And, uh, but we can imagine what it might have been like if they had originally posted an ad that said, you do the boy boss thing, we'll do the SEO thing. Okay. So, to review. The three models of communication. The linear model of Shannon and Weaver. Which includes a sender, a message, and a receiver. And the concept of noise. We add to that the feedback from audiences, which uh, is a model in the interactive model of communication, which arises as media researchers begin to look at the, more of the nuanced details of audience reception to radio and television in the latter half of the 20th century. And more recently, oh, and encoding and decoding with Stuart Hall is a great example of this. And thirdly, the transactional model of communication, which is our most sophisticated model of communication so far. And that uh, has, takes us some great examples, the convergence culture of Henry Jenkins and also Easter eggs in Hollywood movies and greater accountability among corporations and media producers as a result of Twitter. So thank you very much for your attention today. Next time we'll talk about the communication continuum of Martin Buber and we will compare this with our three models of communication. I look forward to it. Thanks very much for listening.